Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to jo join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a really exciting one on the Great Controversy. In case you're not aware of that, uh, the Great Controversy is something that Seventh-day Adventists understand in quite a lot more detail than almost any other religious organization. This is lesson number three in that series for April 20th, 2024, entitled, Light Shines in the Darkness. Hmm, well, we'll see what that means. We can, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we look back over the history of the battles between good and evil, between God and Satan, it's amazing that we're even still here. Um, now, as we consider some of the darker times in human history, help us to understand what we can learn from that environment is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> what do we know about the two sides in the great controversy? And I might add just even how they all got started, Jim? Revelation chapter 12, verses seven to nine. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels, but the dragon was defeated, and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil of Satan, that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him, from the American Bible Society Good News Translation. So why do you suppose it calls Satan a dragon? and a serpent. He was a serpent in the Garden of Eden. That's a good combination, a good he's, know, parallel. He's, well, we don't know what a dragon is. I don't know what a dragon really is. Yeah, so, well, it's a Komodo he, dragon. He's what's described as, as a dragon. Mm -hmm. Like the, the Once pagan Roman Empire was described people. as a dragon too. <clears throat> Our Bible study guide says in the books, in the Bible's last book, Revelation, the devil is pictured as a dragon and a serpent. As we just Jim read for us, he is a dragon because he desires to destroy God's people, and he's a serpent because he uses all his cunning lies to deceive them in the, um, in the years after, I'm sorry, deceive them, period. In the years after Christ's death, thousands were tortured, thrown to lions, burned at the stake, by imperial Rome for refusing to, re to worship its idols. Yet in the face of this cruel punishment, many stayed faithful, the gospel continued to spread, and the church grew. Seems amazing that that was the truth. Uh, Jennifer? In the Bible study guide, this week's lesson emphasizes that the great controversy is comprised of two unequal and irreconcilable sides. These sides are unequal because of who God is and who the devil is. While God is the eternal one, the creator, and the loving and righteous king of the universe, the devil and evil have a beginning and thus will have an end. The devil, sin, and evil are temporary aberrations that, though affecting God and the entire universe, will be extinguished by our all-powerful, all-loving, and all-just God. Consequently, the two parties engaged in the great controversy, God and Satan, simply cannot compromise. Can I interrupt for a moment? I'm a little uncomfortable with one statement they make. Since he had a beginning, he must have an end. Does that eventually gonna to apply to all of us? We have a beginning. metaphor at that. <laughs> an insertion of the wrong metaphor to... Okay, go ahead, Jennifer. The Bible depicts the great controversy in terms of a conflict between two radically opposite forces, such as light versus darkness or truth versus lies. True, the side of evil clamors for a compromise with the truth. For such compromise is evil's only chance of survival. <clears throat> The side of evil seeks to secure its survival at any cost in order that it might destroy that which is good or of God. That is why the devil has continually been at work to lure the church into compromise. Unfortunately, 
the church fell into compromise, as did humanity's first parents. The effects of these compromises are seen and felt to this day. God, however, who is the source of truth and light, will never compromise. Trust in God and faithfulness to the truth, as revealed in Jesus through scripture, will safeguard the church from compromise and prevent us from falling prey to the devil. From the Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, yeah. page 39. Now, we are being encouraged to read the book entitled The Great Controversy by Ellen White to go along with these lessons. And the, that book is just amazing. If there's any possibility that you can read it along with these lessons, it will be very, very instructive. Let's look at what will be the major topics of this lesson. Jim, I'm sorry, uh, Gordon? From the Bible Study Guide, in depicting the great controversy, the Bible uses diametrically opposed terms, such as light and darkness, to highlight the fact that God and his people cannot compromise the truth in any way with error and falsehood. Two, from the earliest days of Jesus' ministry and in the subsequent work of his apostles, the devil relentlessly pressured the church to slide into error or, at very least, <clears throat> to compromise God's truth. To compromise truth, however, is tantamount to the betrayal of God and the destruction of truth itself. Ultimately, such compromise constitutes siding with Satan. Yeah, if you have to... <coughs> If truth has to compromise with falsehood, there's no, there's no half-truth. I mean, half-truth means it's half-false, and it, therefore it's false. Um, so... Number four, the only way the church may emerge victorious in the great controversy is to remain faithful to the divine revelation in Jesus Christ and in God's holy word. All that from the Adult Teacher's Bible Study Guide. Yeah. About 300 AD, now this would be 300 years more or less after the birth of Jesus, Satan suddenly changed tactics. Instead of trying to destroy God's people through various means, he decided to the tactic of a compromise would work better. Now, all you experts on history, historians, why did he all of a sudden decide to do that? historically. There was a 10-year period of intense persecution of Christians, and the church grew faster than ever. <laughs> mm. And the devil said, I mean, what do you say when something like that happens? Let's try another tactic. Yeah. yeah this isn't working. However, the faithful and true were not deceived. So long as they maintained the Bible and the Bible only as a safeguard, they were, they were protected. So now he's trying to weasel his way into the church with some compromises and he's left the all out destruction phase. Now is that all out destruction phase ever gonna come back again? I'm sure. Yes. Yes, that will be his final Farewell, if you would, to Christians. Get rid of them, kill them, whatever. If they, if they won't compromise, kill them. So what are the main distinctions that the Bible describes between Jesus and his opponent, Satan? Let's see if we can make these two opposite things, understand them as clearly as possible. Myra? Okay. What Jesus said is true because he is the author of truth. Truth proceeds from the heart of an all-wise, all-loving, all-knowing God. He is the foundation of reality and of all truth. In contrast, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. He is prepared to use lies, deceit, misinformation, and distortion of the truth to lead God's people astray. He deceived Eve in Eden by distorting the truth, creating doubt, and blatantly denying that what God said, Satan's statement, you shall surely, oh. not surely die. In the contest, context of eating the fruit was a clear contradiction of what God had said. Although throughout the centuries, Satan has used the same strategy. 
He undermines confidence in God's word, contradicts God's revealed will, distorts scripture, and at times misquotes the Bible to his advantage. So yeah. what, thank you. What, um, is there any, is there any bad effects on Satan for, from lying? Anything worse than the condition he's already in? As far as I can tell, no. he's a father of lies, so lie all you want. You, you can't get any worse than you already are. <laughs> okay, here's some... What he, what he does with those lies is deceive more and more people. Misery so, loves company. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so he, he's taking more down with himself. Well, he has an awful lot of uh, assistance because he doesn't need to do but a lot of whole work. Or work. It's just... It, there's two people that are attracted to, to his uh, wiles. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at some verses from Scripture itself that talk about truth and lies. John 14, 6, let's start with that one. Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So Jesus says, I am the truth. John 8, 44 is a very interesting passage. Jesus said, speaking to the Jewish leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, you are the children of your father, the devil. And, ooh. Well, that is one of the... Excuse okay. us for a moment, folks. We just had an earthquake here. <laughs> and you want to follow your father's desires. From the very beginning, he was a murderer and has never been in, on the side of truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he's only doing what is natural to him because he's a liar and the father of lies. And if you are his children, what does that make you? Well, Jesus is the author of all truth. As the omnip omnipotent and omniscient creator of the universe, he understands all issues fully. Being wise and loving, he chooses what is right. He always does for his people what is for their, their best good in the end. Satan is not dumb, and he is not deceived. John 8, 32, Jim. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, the Good News Bible. You want to go ahead and read the sure. Ellen White comment there? From the writings of Ellen G. White. Satan well knew that the Holy Scriptures would enable men to discern his deceptions and withstand his power. It was, with the, it, was, it was by the word that even the Savior of the world had resisted his attacks. At every assault, Christ presented the shield of eternal truth, saying, It is written. To every suggestion of the adversary, he opposed the wisdom and power of the word. Can I interrupt for just a second? And who is Jesus quoting when he speaks to the devil? He's quoting himself. He's quoting himself. <laughs> he said, I remember saying. <laughs> Don't you? Don't you remember what I said before? Yeah. I'm sorry, Jim. Go ahead. <laughs> In order for Satan to maintain his sway over men and to establish the authority of the papal usurper, he must keep them in ignorance of the scriptures. The Bible would exalt God and place infinite men in oh, their finite men. Mind, finite men in their true position. Therefore, its sacred truths must be concealed and suppressed. This logic was adopted by the Roman Church. For hundreds of years, the circulation of the Bible was prohibited. The people were forbidden to read it or to have it in their houses, and unprincipled priests and prelates and interpreted its scriptures to sustain their pretensions. Thus, the Pope came to the most universally acknowledged, came to be almost universally acknowledged as the vice regent of God on earth, endowed with authority over the church and state. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 51. So, in what ways do you see Satan using his deceptive power or ways in our world today? Certainly he couldn't, I mean, we're so wise and we have so well educated, we have so much information available on the internet. We couldn't be deceived by Satan's ways, could we? Well, he, 
there's not a lot of time that people have. They, they, a lot of other competition is, is out there to, to take the people's time. They got their work, they got um, amusement, they will spend all kinds of money for, for amusement mm -hmm. and abusement. So, you know, religion, if... if what, what how, the, who has time for that, right? No, a few do. Satan's deceptive ways were apparent to Paul even in his day. Jennifer? From Acts chapter 20, verses 27 to 32. For I have not held back from announcing to you the whole purpose of God. So keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock which the Holy Spirit has placed in your care. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he made his own through the blood of his Son. I know that after I leave, fierce wolves will come among you, and they will not spare the flock. The time will come when some men from your own group will tell lies to lead the believers away after them. Watch then and remember that with many tears, day and night, I taught every one of you for three years from the Good News Bible. Now that's what's important in that passage. Well, there's a couple things that are really important. Look out, there's wolves coming. But it's not just look out, there's wolves coming. The wolves are coming from where? Within. Within the church organization. Within the church organization. Certainly that doesn't mean within the Seventh-day Adventist church. How could it? Yeah. Well. Or does it? I mean, if, if there's a group, any group that's trying to preach the truth and, and live the truth on earth, where would Satan want to do his, his thing if he possibly could? I mean, the closer you are to God and the farther you are from his ways, the more, the more he hates it. You mean we have to evaluate what's even said in the church? That's correct. Even from the podium? Even from the podium. Ellen White said that very distinctly. Satan did not try to cause huge sudden changes in the church. He brought in errors subtly, one by one. However, the faithful church leaders, even in Paul's day, saw the danger. Gordon? 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 7 through 12. The mysterious wickedness is already at work, but what is going to happen will not happen until the one who holds it back is taken out of the way. Now, let me interrupt again for a second. If God has a way of holding things like that back, why doesn't he just do it all the time? Wouldn't that be the obvious thing to do? I don't, I don't think he wants to hold things back. I think he wants it to be like it was in the Garden of Eden, but he has to hold it back. Okay, well, read on, Gordon. We have to face reality sometime. Verse 8, Then the wicked one will be revealed, but when the Lord Jesus comes, he will kill him with a breath from his mouth and destroy him with his dazzling presence. The wicked mm. one will come with the power of Satan and perform all kinds of false miracles and wonders and use every kind of wicked deceit on those who will perish. They will perish because they did not welcome the love, the truth, so much as to be saved. They did not welcome and love the truth so much as to be saved. So, so, as, to so be saved. as to be saved. Verse 11, and so God sends the power of error to work in them so that they believe what is false. The result is that all who have not believed the truth but have taken pleasure in sin will be condemned from the Good News Bible. Are there any people in our world today have taken pleasure in sin? Most of us. <laughs> well, okay. Maybe all Myra? Of us. Yes. The Bible study guide says, contrary to the second commandment, idols were introduced into Christian worship. For millennia, idols were in the forefront of all pagan religions. To make Christianity more acceptable to heathen, heathens coming into the Christian church, pagan deities were renamed as so-called saints. Sunday, the day of worship for the sun god, was gradually adopted as the day of Christian worship in order to honor, in honor of the resurrection. This false day, not sanctioned by in scripture, prevails even now. Hmm. That's what's Monday, called April syncretism, 15th. isn't yes. it? We were in a 
country in South America taking a tour of a religious institution and the preacher, shall we say, there uh, that was giving the tour used the word syncretism several times, mm -hmm. talking about the you, idols, shall we say? Well, and, what, they, what they did, and, and as you know, um, if you if you sort of include some of the beliefs that the, the native people already have into your church, then it makes it easier for them to join in. That's right. That's the very elements of Catholicism. It's a Catholic meaning universal. Mm -hmm. So the bits and pieces around the world are incorporated into the from the cultures into what they call Catholicism. They call it Christianity, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a well, are we... They're not hiding it. It's Catholic. Yeah. That's what it means. Are we personally compromising any way with Satan's deceptions in our day? Look at the uh, website, Advent Messenger, mm -hmm. and take, take a... Even in his prayer just before his trial and crucifixion, Jesus pointed out what the safe path for us would be. Jennifer 7... I'm sorry, John 17, 15, 17... I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but I do ask you to keep them safe from the evil one. Just as I do not belong to the world, they do not belong to the world. Dedicate them to yourself by means of the truth. Your word is truth. Paul repeated that message as recorded in Acts 20. Jim? Acts 20, verses, verse 32. And now I commend you to the care of God and to the message of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you blessings God has for all His people. Good News Bible. Jennifer, you want to move on there? From the Bible Study Guide. The Bible is the infallible revelation of God's will. It presents heaven's plan for humanity's salvation. Since, quote, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, end quote, it is, quote, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's from 2 Timothy 3.16. That is, quote, all scripture is inspired by God, not some parts or some parts more than others. The whole Bible must be accepted as the word of God. Otherwise, the door is wide open for deception. Okay. That, that is, uh, somebody doesn't have enough understanding of the Bible, to, and that's why they made up a statement that is not true like that. It's only when Paul, what Paul says, all scripture that is inspired of God or all scripture inspired of God is valuable. Not all scripture, just because it's in writing doesn't mean it's from God. Mm -hmm. and, and we know, Ken knows that. We've known it for years. Yeah. And when well, we let this guy, he says, oh, it's infallible. It, what do you do with Jeremiah 7.22 when it says oh. the, the scribes have made it into a lie? And Jesus says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. Well, that's true. What I said, just said it. What I he said was true. I know it's true. But what this guy says, he doesn't understand. He hasn't studied enough. Well, uh, obviously. You know, I'm not going to let him off the hook. The Bible in the, in, the, in the grand picture, that's why we're talking about the great controversy, is inspired. There's no question I'm about that. I'm fully in harmony with that. Yeah. Well, our job is to teach them people what the truth is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then they can learn to read the Bible on their own, but they need some help. Yeah. That's a weird, why we've, you've had these classes for, what, 15, 20 years or more? Well, um, we, and we need to understand there's things that are obvious that we, we need to sort of maybe help people wake up a little bit. Is it possible for a lie to be inspired? It could be, it could be, it's, it could, they, a person be might be inspired by a lie, but it is not inspired by the creator, the one only well, true God. There, there can be lies in an inspired document, such as uh, Satan's lies in the Garden of Eden. Exactly. You know, saying that That's God a, is a, God is an, a liar. It's, inspi it's it, an inspired it, it, record. Yes. It's what really happened. Yeah. And of course, Satan doesn't want us to believe that, so... He's, that's why he's gotten many Christians to, to say that the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you know, the creation and the fall and the flood, 
those are uh, myths. They're there for teaching us some important lessons, but they're not really true. Did I use the wrong verse? It should have been Jeremiah 8, verse 8. Did I say... Oh, you Jer said 7 something. Se uh, Jeremiah 7, 22. Well, the NIV is, is incorrect. <laughs> that, but I, I, I misspoke. It's, it's Jeremiah 8, verse 8, is, or it so says the scribes are, the, are made it into a lie. If we, um, if we look at the Greek and we understand the way it's worded, a more correct translation of that verse would say, every inspired, every scripture inspired by God is also useful. Yes. And the reason for that is, if you understand the context, this is 2 Timothy, and what was, what was the circumstances in which 2 Timothy was written? Paul was giving advice to young Timothy. Okay, and under what circumstances? Near, near, near Paul's end. This is his last book. He's in prison in an awful dungeon in Rome, and he's giving final instructions. And what he's really saying to Timothy is, <clears throat> remember in those days there weren't books with nice pages and printing like we have today. Everything was on a scroll and it was handwritten. And, and there, were, there were, I mean, you can be sure the devil is busy producing pho phony documents. There were lots of phony documents around. And so what Paul is saying here is, every inspired scripture is, in, is, is useful. And, and Timothy, you know how to distinguish the good ones from the bad ones. That's what he's really saying. About okay. the time Paul was, was writing, we had the Gnostic Gospels mm -hmm. were, were somewhat current there and uh, had a lot of weird ideas about, uh, about God. And one more thing that I think we should add, uh, very cautiously I will say this, the King James Version, which is beloved by so many people, including myself, Nevertheless, I have to tell you that in its original version, 1611, when it was first came out, it included all of the Apocrypha, which Protestant Christians say is not inspired. But if you say the King James Version descended from heaven on a cloud and is the inspired version, you're going to have to accept the entire Apocrypha. I, I think that because of the Bible is the way it is, it, it, with the instruction, people can learn to dis develop their discern, their capacity to discern to and read sort all out. So they're not thrown with the, with the news media, thrown for a loop or some yeah. salesman with, with his uh, slick uh, words. Well, and the point is you need to read all of it and you need to compare scripture with scripture. And but a lot of people don't have the time or the, or the it, it, let's face it, it's tough reading, so especially the King James. And, yeah. and, and, and we're talking about, it was out of date uh, three or 400 years ago. Where would Christians be even in our day if we did not have the Bible? What would we know about the life of Jesus? His suffering, his sacrifice, his resurrection and his ascension? Satan does not have to gain everything all at once. He can introduce errors little by little. Jennifer, I think that's yours. Mm, okay. Little. 14. Tragically. Thank you. <laughs> I think jumped. Um, Bible study guide. Tragically, especially through the inroads of modern thinking, many theologians and Christians focus so much on the human side of Scripture that the Bible becomes the word of man instead the word of God. The Bible, they argue, is the writings of kings, shepherds, a fisherman, priests, poets, and others who shared their understandings and conceptions of God, of nature, and of reality the best that the best that they, in their time and place, understood them. Really now, if this were true, why should we, living today in the 21st century, really care about what these people thought, much less make what they thought the foundation for our hope of eternity? We shouldn't. From the adults. Yeah. <laughs> well, even back. So, so, I've heard this ar that argument before. Yeah. yeah. The Bible is just a record of you know, kings and prophets and fishermen and so on. You know, it's their view of it. It's not, it's not inspired by God. And then you come to places like Daniel and something is prophesied 2,300 years in advance. Let's see, which, which fisherman could have figured that out? Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, even back in the days of David, it was understood clearly that the Bible uh, writings that have been given through the inspiration of God were our safety. And here's several passages from the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalms 119. Gordon? Your word is a lamp to guide me and a light for my path. Jumping to 116. Give me strength as you promised and I shall live. Don't let me d be disappointed in my hope. The explanation of your teachings gives light and brings wisdom to the ignorant. As you have promised, keep me from falling. Don't let me be overcome by evil from the Good News Bible. So Satan in his subtle ways convinced many human beings to rely on their own thinking. It's a very big temptation for people to think, even the people who claim to be good Bible students, that they know what it should say. So they're going to sort of modify it to ma manage what they think it should say. Mm -hmm. But the Bible had warned about that as well. Myra? Yes, Proverbs 16, 25 says, what do you think is the right road? What, what you think is the right road may lead to death. Good News Bible. And Judges 21, 25 says, there is no king in Israel. There was no king in Israel at that time. All the people did just as they pleased. Good so you need, a, you need a king to tell you what to believe? Oh, God. <laughs> Isaiah 53, 6 says, all of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserve. One of the devil's, this is from our Bible study guide again, one of the devil's most effective deceptions is to lead us to believe that human reasoning, unaided by the Holy Spirit and uninformed by the Word of God, is sufficient to understand God's will. There may be a way that seems right to us or even to uh, entire cultures, but it may be totally wrong in the eyes of God. Uh, from our Bible study guide for Wednesday. So why is human reasoning so often convincing to our minds? But it, isn't it true that we could find God in nature? Are we yeah. not using human reasoning and wisdom? Yeah, it does, no, it doesn't say you shouldn't use human reasoning at all. We couldn't, pers we couldn't understand, we couldn't even understand what's in the, what the Bible says without human reason. But it says if we, if we, go to human reason with and in unneeded. contrast to what the Bible teaches, then we're, we're into trouble. In Romans 2, 14 and 15, a passage I, I really enjoy, and that is when Paul says, when those who do not have the law do what the law requires, shows that the law is written on their heart, and so on and so forth. It's, right. it's really a, a great passage, which it doesn't imply or doesn't say, yeah, because they have their own Bible, no. They, they don't have a written co uh, communication, but the infinite, with, through the radio waves that he uses, can communicate to us finite beings in time and space. You don't need written words. Um, it yeah. doesn't need uh, holograms to, to communicate. A lot, of course, a lot of that is through his, through his created works. Yeah, but yes. he still... Spirit, everybody is born with, mm, with yeah. some sort of a conscience, okay? And if you reject that, or either via uh, time and uh, mm. uh, turning it off or uh, drugs or mm. whatever, human alcohol. reasoning, Human reasoning can never provide any absolutes. As sure as one person has an idea that they are convinced absolutely about, someone else will disagree. This does not mean that human reasoning has no place. When carefully studied, the Bible appeals to human reason. Think of the story of Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 2. I mean, you know, pretty impressive when we look back at human history and we look at what Daniel saw in advance and there it is spelled out in considerable detail. That's pretty impressive. So look at 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 6. For if the gospel we preach is hidden, it is hidden only from those who are being lost. They do not believe because their minds have been kept in the dark by the evil God of this world. He keeps them from seeing the light shining on them, the light that comes from the good news about the glory of Christ, 
who is the exact likeness of God. For it is not ourselves that we preach, we preach Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. The God who said, quote, out of darkness the light shall shine, end quote, is the same God who made his light shine in our hearts to bring us the knowledge of God's glory, shining in the face of Christ. So what kind of deception is being discussed in these verses? Mm. I think that, Jim, that's yours. Well, the Bible study guide, the Greek word for mind in the passage in, is mean, no. noema. Mm. It literally means that our perception, our mental faculties. The SDA Bible Commentary makes an enlightening statement about this verse. And here's what the commentary make, says about it. <coughs> Jennifer, you want to take that? Sure. <coughs> the battle between Christ and Satan is a battle for the minds of men. You can see multiple passages in the Bible talk about that. Satan's principal work is to, is to blind or darken men's minds. He does this by keeping them from the study of God's word, by deranging the powers of the mind through the excesses of body and soul, by wholly occupying the mind through the things of this life, and by appealing to pride and self-exaltation. Are there any people living in our world today are, that are wholly occupied by the things of this life? 99% wow. or more. Paul introduced us to this complex issue. Gordon? Romans 7, 23 to 25. But I see a different law at work in my body, a law that fights against the law which my mind approves of. It makes me a prisoner to the law of sin which is at work in my body. What an unhappy man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is taking me to death? Thanks be to God who does this through our Lord Jesus Christ. This then is my condition. On my own, I can serve God's law only with my mind, while my human nature serves the law of sin. Wow, that's pretty scary, huh? In Romans 12, 2, do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good, and is pleasing to him and is perfect. So how do we let God transform us? By beholding, we become changed. And where is that verse found? 2 Corinthians 3.18. I should have put it in here, huh? Yeah. So how is it that we are so often led astray? Well, the Bible study guide says, the lack of knowledge on the part of the lost is not because they could not know, it is because they would not know. Many have had every opportunity to know the truth, but chose not to believe. And Satan blinded their eyes. Satan's kingdom is a kingdom of darkness, as the... Uh, Surprise. As, yeah. <laughs> as the SDA Bible commentary adds, the gospel is the only means by which Satan's diabolical schemes and deceptions can be exposed and by which men can see the way from darkness to light. Volume 6, page 854. And quoted in our Bible study guide. Well, the amount of information we have about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is fairly limited. I mean, if you think about the ancient documents, it's four Gospels and then comments about it in the other small, small letters. Even the entire New Testament is a relatively small document. It forms the heart of the gospel. Jesus told the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews, that the entire scriptures from beginning to end were a revelation about him. John 1, 4 through 14, we're gonna pick just a couple of spots. The word was a source of life and this life brought uh, light to humanity. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has never put it out. And when John 1 is talking about the light, who's he talking about? Christ. The Spirit. Christ. This was the real light, the light that comes into the world and shines on everyone. The Word became a human being and full of grace and truth, lived among us. We saw His glory, 
the glory which he received as the Father's only Son. But the devil was not asleep. He has been working continually in subtle ways to corrupt God's church. Ellen White adds, the same spirit of hatred and opposition to the truth has inspired the enemies of God in every age, and the same vigilance and fidelity have been required in his servants. The words of Christ to the first disciples are applicable to his followers to the close of time. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Mark 13, 37, from, quoted from Great Controversy 56 and 57. Jim? Oh, the Bible says to guide. In many parts of the world, especially where people have free access to the Bible, Satan has employed other means to weaken its influences. One, one very effective way has been through various scientific endeavors or even biblical scholarship, which sometimes takes positions that, if, un, if accepted, would undermine trust in the Word of God. For example, though the book of Daniel dates itself to more than 500 years before Christ, Many Bible scholars date it instead in the middle of the second century BC. They argue that it had to be written at this time, otherwise the prophet would have been accurately would have been accurately telling the future, and that can't happen. God would forbid not. that even God could predict the future. Go ahead. Therefore, they argue Daniel was not written when they saw. Could, when, when it says that it was but... It, when it says it was. Therefore they argue Daniel was not written when it says it was, but rather hundreds of years later. Unfortunately, this lie about the Bible is one of the many modern scholarships scholarship seeks to foist upon us. And more unfortunately, people... Many people accept the error because, after all, Bible scholars are teaching it. No wonder Paul warned it, us. Test all things. Hold fast. It, it's good. First Corinthians, excuse me, First Thessalonians 2. No, 20, five, five, First Thessalonians 5, 21, my sakes. Are uh, we, go ahead. That's from the Bible study guide. Yeah. Are we beginning to get a hint about Satan's methods? Do you see them subtly being used even in our day? Jennifer? From the Bible study guide, number one. What are our greatest safeguards against misinterpreting God's word? Number two. Satan's major attempt in the great controversy between good and evil is to malign God's character and present him as an authoritarian, unloving tyrant. How does the evil one attempt to do this? And what is God's response to his lies? I mean, how do we, how do people respond to that in general is, is in our day? How, and how, and what's, the, what's the basis? I mean, if, we don't, if we're not sure about the Bible, if we're not really convinced that we need to read it from cover to cover and, and compare all the stories with the, what everything, look at the whole overall theme, this great controversy thing we're talking about. You can take, um, there's so many stories in the Bible you can say, you can take and twist them a little bit and make it God look really bad. And that's what people do. Okay, go ahead. And number three, the Apostle Peter affirms that, quote, no prophecy is of private interpretation. End quote from 2 Peter 1.20. How can we be sure we do not distort the meaning of Scripture to achieve our own ends? Why might this be easier to do than we realize? How can we safeguard ourselves against it? The Bible study guide. We know what it should say, right? One of we Satan's... can interpret it to make it fit whatever we want. <laughs> One of Satan's most successful methods has been to suggest compromise. Is compromise good or bad? Consider these comments from the Bible study guide regarding compromise. Gordon? In various social contexts, such as family life and politics, compromise is considered acceptable and in many situations even desirable. 
Generally, the word compromise refers to reaching an agreement, to settling by mutual concession for the middle ground between the positions of two or more parties. The key to such an agreement lies in concession. Each side must cede something so that both or all sides can continue to exist or live together. In some cases, each side compromises because none has the strength to convince or overcome and control the other side by force. In other cases, the parties compromise simply because they want to live together peaceably as neighbors or as family in love or mutual respect. In the context of the latter perspective, compromise certainly has a positive connotation, appearing as a solution to conflict and as an opportunity for peaceful coexistence. These types of compromises are common in our daily lives and involve negotiation or tolerance. Don't we see that all the time in politics? Really? <laughs> hmm. However, in general, compromise is perceived as a negative phenomenon, implying the loss of an essential value, principle, truth, or quality. A compromised lot of medicine, immune system, national identity, education, morality, reputation, harvest, or military position are all undesirable and unacceptable compromises because they threaten our very way of life or existence. How about God? Could not he compromise with the rebel angels or with fallen humans to avoid the war in heaven and to allow all to coexist peacefully? Yeah, just, just introduce a little bit of air <coughs> into God's truth. That shouldn't be any problem, right? Yeah. Could he not at least tolerate the tolerate the opposing party? If the opposing side wanted independence or autonomy, could not God grant this request? Could he not simply give the rebels a region somewhere in a corner of the universe that they might live by themselves instead of being exterminated? Mm -hmm. Interesting approach, and that's been questioned by some others. The answer is complex. Several points, however, may help elucidate it from the teacher's Bible study guide. Okay, the Bible study guide proceeds, suggesting there is no compromise by God. Myra? Okay, first, there is a quantitative difference between... No, qualitative. Qual I'm sorry, qualitative difference be between our daily negotiations and the compromise that Lucifer was desirous of achieving. God created us with all the freedom necessary to express ourselves, to interact, to negotiate with others in love and in righteousness. However, there are some physical and moral limitations that cannot be compromised because of these limits, because these limits constitute the very foundation of our existence. This foundation is comprised of the truths that God is our creator, our provider, our lawgiver, and as such reveals how much, how we should live our lives in order to be happy. And, and our king. And our king. Let me interrupt for a second. What if God said, well, I'm busy. I'm only going to support your life 90% um, of the time. We'd be 100% uh, dead. Yeah. <laughs> We'd be 100% Said that. I mean, you know, at what point do you want to, you want to compromise? Mm, yeah. I'll give you 50% of the oxygen you need in the air. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Okay. God is the source of our life. We simply cannot exist without him. Lucifer wanted to change this very foundation. He challenged God's character, status, and authority and claimed that humans were gods, Genesis 3, 4. By um, having existence in themselves and having the ability to create their own meanings of and standards for life and happiness. Yeah, you don't, teacher's Bible study guide. You don't have to follow God's way. You know, you're independent people. You can think for yourself, right? Well, you can turn that and say, well, God is an authoritarian and you have to follow God or, you know, rather than God gives you the freedom of loving and having a happy life. And then the famous verse, 
Genesis 3, 4, the snake replied, that's not true. You will not die. Now, we've talked about this before. Jim uh, has some questions about this. Ha do we have any evidence that anyone had ever died in the past? Uh, nothing no. in writing that, I, that yeah. I've ever seen. So we have no evidence for that. What we do know is that God doesn't lie. So when Satan says God lied to you, you better have a great big red flag. Well, we learned, we learned, we can have to be confident that God doesn't lie because we've studied it enough, long enough and it, it, he, he's consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like he takes a, a pound of hamburger and slicks a, a cyanide capsule and, ha and feeds it to the dog on the other side of the fence. Yeah. Uh, it, it, that's, you deceived the dog mm -hmm. but to, to, to make, take advantage of the situation. Yeah. But uh, God doesn't operate that. And he's, he's the infinite one. Mm -hmm. He's not insecure that he has to operate on the level of deception or distortion yeah. or lies or whatever you want to call it. And Myra used a, gr a great uh, term there that uh, the freedom to choose. Yeah. Freedom is the very foundation is elementary with the way the Creator operates. Yeah. And uh, if, you, if you can't understand that, you're not going to understand uh, uh, love. Dennis Prager, if, if, if you're, any of you ever listened to him, he says, our job is to uh, to, to obey God. To, uh, to uh, God demands that you uh, obedience is basically what he says. And, and the man at that level, he's a very bright guy, but that level, he's a fool. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have a second point. The Bible study guide goes on discussing compromise. Second, and closely related to the point above is the nature of sin. Sin is not merely holding a dissenting opinion. Sin is a conscious and deliberate rebellion against and rejection of God's claim that He is the only Creator, Provider, Lawgiver, and King. Sin cannot tolerate the existence of such a God. The foundational impulse of sin is to topple this God from His throne and install self as the King. And how many people would like to do that? The devil, however, offers a compromise. He would be willing to renounce his call for a total rejection of God's existence as long as he, Lucifer, was also recognized as a god. God, on the other hand, allows no room for such a compromise or negotiation with sin. What can his, he concede on, the par, on his part? To say that he is not the creator? To say he is not the provider? To say that he is not the source of life and standard of happiness and morality? to say that angels and humans can have life without him? I mean, obviously none of those things could possibly be true. Any of these would be a lie. While compromise would be a triumph for the devil, compromise would mean capitulation for God. So the next third item, Jim? Third, and closely related to the first two counts, the situation described above is not only about truth and honor, but constitutes the ultimate life and death situation. Let us imagine for the moment that we are Adam and Eve. We are in the setting in which Satan and God explain their positions to us prior to the fall into sin. Satan claims that God lies, lies to us, that we are autonomous, that we are gods, that we are immortal. There, furthermore, he asserts that we can reject God's claims, can reject God's claims and not to and die. And will not die. And will not die, Genesis 3, 4, because we contain life, original and underived, within ourselves. Further, Satan accuses God of using his claim of being the source and standard of life to control us, control us all. This divine claim for Satan is, is dictatorship, autocracy, me, autocracy, abuse, deception, and injustice. According to Satan, the effects that God does not want to compromise com com corroborates the fact that God does not no. want to... His allegations, corroborates his allegations. Does not want to compromise or corroborate his allegations. For the, I'm sorry. For this reason, 
Satan calls us to break free from the God's from God's lies and abuse that is in quotes and experience a new consciousness and autonomy wherein we will discover and enjoy our infinite and eternal divine potential but aren't they just allegations and speculations do we not run the risk of dying or disappearing from the existence if we consist Disconnect. disconnect from God. It is worth, is it worth trying just to prove a theory empirically? Lucifer thought, certain, Lucifer certainly thought it was worth taking that risk. Wow. God, on the other hand, tells us that, tells us that he is the only creator and provider, and thus we cannot exist without him. He tells us that if we do not believe him, he he will reject excuse me if we reject him and his affirmations we will disconnect from him at the source of life and we will die that is disappear from existence god explains to us that this outcome is not mere speculation but the fact becomes but a fact because he is a creator we did not excuse me we did not create ourselves and we are not eternal this fact alone based on the words on his word must be sufficient for us to believe him. However, God points out that his claims his claims are also evidence of our power, of our past and present life. That is, as long as we have believed in him and believe him, everyone has, everyone has been happy. The entire universe has been running smoothly and is not one has died. No one has died. And not one. We're talking and about no being one, in Adam and Eve's right. position. It, this is the, the discussion. God further explains to us that they compromise, that he cannot compromise, not only because he is right, but because he is, the, if he does, he renounces the throne, all of us and the entire universe will disappear from the existence since he is the only provider of, or sustainer of or of existence and life. For this reason, God calls us to believe him, to trust him, to stay with him, and to live happily with him forever. We need to wind <clears> up <throat> there because uh, we're running out of time. We'll put the story to you, and what do you think? Would you have accepted Satan's charges or believed God's truth? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a blessing it is to have the truth laid out before us as clearly as possible. Help us not to make wrong choices and not to compromise with the devil is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.